The sound of the rifle was muted, the rain more than masking the rasp of the round being loaded into it and locked into place. Not that the Calambian marksman was anywhere near enough to an enemy to be overheard. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Horus, where is your victory? Said Joseph, the words of his faith flowing freely under his breath as his grim work was done. He sighted down the powerful scope, lenses kept religiously clean by his care and rewarding him with a crisp and clear line of sight on the replique soldiers who guarded the three-legged walker tanks. They had yellow markings over their white armors and held what looked like flamers and melta-guns. The sting of death is but sin, and the strength of sin is the law of the Xenos. He whispered, eyes searching. He held more of the large rounds between his fingers, even as he used his arms to brace and aim the massive rifle. When the time came, the enemy would not know him as a sniper. They would know him as death, as the orcs had known him, as the Tyranids had before them. Joseph came from a long line of marksmen, and they had refined their skills to the point of obsession. Even now, Joseph expected, his son Ezekiel was back with the rest of the Calambian tugs and conveyors, being seen to a new home, assembling and disassembling his rifle all the while, dreaming of the day he could drill in earnest once more. But Joseph pushed thoughts of his son and family down, keeping his focus on the words of the Akasha and on his search for his target. He found it only a few seconds later, hovering near the back lines on some kind of floating sled. The massive tank that these flame troopers were using to reload and refuel their weapons. The sniper felt his lips quirk slightly. He had been uncertain that he'd be able to spot it from his current position, low as it was, but smothered his enthusiasm as soon as it flared up. The founder only condoned the taking of Xenos' life, and, say what you will, these replicae were human. Their deaths were a tragic necessity. He aimed his sights for the center of the fuel tank and braced himself carefully. The round he had loaded into his anti-material rifle was tremendously explosive all on its own, and every shot from the nearly six-foot-long weapon kicked like an ogren's ripper gun. He was lying flat against the ground, his repel ropes pooled around him. But thanks be to the Founder, who bestows on us victory through our Lord Leto the God Emperor. The Calambian whispered to himself, the words of the Akasha a calming salve on his sizzling nerves. He had been tasked with coming to this place with his spotter, who had fallen to his death as they had scaled the side of the massive park platform. But it was not the death of his friend which had him so shaken. He'd grieve later, he'd have to. It also wasn't the knowledge that... If he got careless, his gun's recoil could kick him off the ledge, or even that his shots would be visible and loud, drawing all of the enemy's attention to his admittedly distant location. It was that his shot would signal the start of Major Lazarus's plan, that at the sound of his gun, the rest of the Columbian Patriots would begin their last-ditch effort to destroy the sniper tanks and secure some kind of evac from the devils barking orders back at high command. He'd never had so much responsibility heaped onto him, never been so crucial in the start of an operation, not like this at least. Were they all in place, all ready for the mission to begin? He checked his chrono and clenched his teeth. The allotted time had come and was rapidly passing. The combined survivors at the bridge were, even then, doing all they could to hold the bulk of the enemy's attention. Joseph steeled himself, leaning into his rifle. He would simply need to have faith that directly across the vast distance to the opposite side of the park platform, his brothers and sisters in arms were ready, hanging by their own repels, prepared to come over the lip, guns blazing. Oh, death, where is your sting? He asked his rifle. The man squeezed a nearly numb finger around the gun's warm trigger, and his weapon loyally answered the question with a single, thundering shout. It spoke the language of ruin, of annihilation and finality, its breath the exhalation of death's response. 
Here spoke the rifle, and in its wake the reaper did sing. Death was everywhere, reigning in and around them in all its various forms. The replicate soldiers had blown down most of the Imperial barricades, but had found their intended massacre stifled by the deep trenches the Kriegers had edged out of the false earth of the park. Cadians, Kriegers, and all others who had managed to survive this long, crowded shoulder to shoulder with comrades and corpses, guns bristling from their jagged trench lines. The Republic's toy soldiers had been set on pelting them from a distance, but after seeing how ineffective this was and feeling how hard Imperial munitions could punch back, had chosen to roll over them in a rush of bodies and blasters instead. The troopers were infuriated, roaring in their helmets as they closed in, blasters blazing blue like neutron stars. Initially, all Thirteen had been able to manage was to jam himself between Julian and Emiliana, single arm thrust out with his Hell Pistol held aloft. From that position, he had managed to fell three of the incoming replicae before a blue bolt took him in the face, the glancing shot sufficient to knock him from the line and out of the waking world. For a time, a long time, or a brief time, there was simply cool, calm, nothing. No cares, no compulsions, no thoughts at all. And then, searing pain paired with the touch of life. Thirteen gasped, dragging fresh air into his lungs and almost screaming it out right away. He tried to rise, tried to bring his hand up to his burning face, but was held down. Through the haze of his pain, he barely made out Jackna's face her violet eyes staring down into his. She yanked a syringe out of his chest and he barely felt the spine-chilling sensation through the agony racking his face. He could feel the cold air and rain on his skin and against his wound, ripping screams out of his mouth. Hold still, damn it, 13, hold still, you're going to lose a whole lot more than your eye! She yelled through the din of battle and his own voice. He registered her order, clamping his teeth shut almost over his tongue and groaning beneath her, trying to go limp to let her work. The ground trembled as explosives went off near their trench, Jackna covering his face with her body and shielding him from the rain of mud and blood which followed, before backing off and continuing the work. His fingers dug into the churned, wet soil. Toes flexing and clawing the insides of his boots as she worked over his ruined eye with surgical gear, each snip and cut sending flashes up his skull and pain into his very soul. He almost wished she'd just kill him instead and allow him to return to nothing. But something in him kept the desire from being quite as genuine as it would have been before. Though it felt like an eternity, Jackna finally concluded her work flicking away a bloody ball of something 13 tried not to think about, before using some kind of spray on the burnt parts of his face. Right away he sighed, twitching limbs easing up and going still, letting him catch his breath and recover for a brief time as she wrapped her work in bandages, tying them off tightly. Mm, my gun. 13 muttered as she pulled away. The medic frowned for a moment, as if she did not quite understand him, before she made sense of his words and laughed, taking a moment to fish the pistol from some place beside her. She didn't hand it to him, instead sliding it into the holster at his side. Don't move, you plank, she told him. You are barely holding together and I doubt your heart can take another steam of any kind. Just sit tight and try not to get shot anymore. She had started to say, but as she did, Thirteen saw something terrible. Above her he could see the lip of their trench, and, standing there, having just arrived, was a replique of the Republic, shouldering its gun and preparing to fire. He reacted without thinking, grabbing Jackna by the arm and throwing her away as he rolled. The enemy trooper fired, catching the medic's left arm instead of her back. The shot hit dead on, and the woman screamed as the unguarded limb was blown clean off. She curled around the stump of her lost arm, going still shortly after, and Thirteen knew not if she had died from shock or merely lost consciousness. 
and he had no time to find out. He rolled in the mud, fumbling to draw his returned firearm, but not managing to pull it free before the Republic trooper had sighted him and fired. The trooper only scored a near miss, as its shoulder and most of the back of its head were blown into a red rain by a close quarters blast from Julian's shotgun. Thirteen was grateful, but there was not even a moment for a brief thanks as more of the replique arrived at the lip, firing down all along the line. Julian discharged his shotgun into another clone looming over them, and Thirteen, pistol now in his hands again, covered him by lancing two holes in another soldier that was attempting the very same thing on Julian. When a third warrior emerged from the reigning gloom of their trench line, the Cadian greeted it with an empty shotgun pitched right into its face. Thirteen finished that one as well, putting three holes in its chest, but not before it tossed a present of its own into their trench, a grenade. Julian dove to the ground, scrambling for it and grasping it with cold hands. He rose and reared high to pitch the damn thing when it went off, still clutched in his hand. Julian's body seemed to pop, smearing his blood, bones, and armor across the trench and only narrowly avoiding Thirteen, who was already on the ground. His head was ringing from the pressure of the blast, and he could barely make out what was happening around him with his one remaining eye. Was Emiliana still alive? Was anyone? He groaned, feeling the rain washing the mud and blood off of his face and bandages as he rose to his feet, feeling more than hearing the thump beside him as someone jumped down into the trench. The Imperial spun, ducking and narrowly avoiding the swung butt of a clone rifle, planting his knees into the ground as he pressed the steel end of his Hell Pistol into the replique's chest, and fired, creating holes in the enemy soldier. But it was not the only one. Thirteen spun again, pressing himself against the side of the trench and barely avoiding a cascading line of death issued by a minigun-wielding replique. The plasma weapon spat out a volley of fast bolts, scything down the trench and killing more guardsmen. Thirteen waited for the blaster fire to pass before leaning out, extending his one good arm to fire and pulled the trigger. Yet his shot sailed through empty air without connecting, sent wide as another clone dove down into the trench, catching his arm and wrestling Thirteen down to the ground. The Krieger kicked and struggled, grunting and gritting his teeth as the clone elbowed him in the face and forced open his hand. Thirteen panted, kneeing the replique's armored torso again and again, but getting nowhere and feeling a pit open in his stomach as his gun was forced from his fingers. The replique trooper tossed away its own cumbersome rifle, drawing its own blaster pistol as it continued to wrestle with the Krieger. Thirteen fought hard but was one-armed and wounded, leaving him in a distinct disadvantage that the Republic soldier was quick to make use of. The replique shoved its blaster pistol almost into Thirteen's mouth before it was kicked off of him, T-Visor shattering against Gregor's boot. The big man shot the enemy a few times with his las gun and reached down, grasping the Krieger by his collar and lifting him up without apparent effort, pinning him to the wall briefly as he set the soldier upright. Come on, kid! He barked, having no more time to speak as he hefted his lasgun up and opened up a spray of fire, catching the minigunner just as it had begun to sweep its weapon back down towards their direction. The clone screamed and fell, body smoking as it landed atop a pile of others two men deep. As this was happening, replicate soldiers from behind them opened fire, cracking and shattering the flak armor Gregor wore and scorching his body badly. But the huge Cadian did not drop. For the Emperor! He bellowed, staggering around and leaning against the muddy wall as he loosed his fire against them, the scattering shots less than accurate, yet the cover in the trench affording the Republic troops little options for escape. Blue shots punched into Gregor again and again, but the man only slumped down to a sitting position once the two clones before him had dropped, the third managing to scramble back up and out of the trench before he followed suit. The young Krieger watched it all, mud flowing over the sides of the pits they were fighting in and streaming thickly over his arms and neck. Looking on, he could see the big man was breathing raggedly and bleeding from several wounds that Thirteen guessed were, or would be, lethal.
still, he couldn't stop himself from coming to the Cadian's defense as another clone leapt over the lip and began firing. Thirteen yelled, running with all the might he had left as the replicate soldier turned to face him. Feeling the long barrel of the blaster skipping and sliding along the armor on his shoulder before he impacted the trooper and slammed it into the opposite wall. They grappled and the Krieger realized he would need help to overcome the hand-to-hand -hand advantage the enemy had over him. Doing what he could with one arm, he eventually found that help in the form of a rigid handle pressed against the back of his arm, which was wrapped around the torso of the Republic soldier. A shovel! One of the tools which had been used to carve out the trench, left here in the haste it had taken to get ready for the battle, now his. He loosened his grip on the enemy to grab the handle, and the trooper kicked him off in response. Instead of resisting the blow, the Krieger rolled with it, spinning as he drew the digging instrument out from behind the replique's back and slashed it across the clone's eyes, shattering the visor there. Thirteen's back hit the muddy wall with a splat, the wet earth sucking and squelching as he pulled himself back off, single arm raised. The replique fell back, clutching its wounded eyes, and never rose again as Thirteen leapt atop him, shovel rising and falling as the Imperial hacked the clone to pieces. He would have kept hacking till his arm lost its strength, but Thirteen caught movement from the corner of his eye and spun, instinct dominating his every action as he threw the shovel end over end. That saved him from the first trooper, but not the second, who shot twice, narrowly missing him as he jumped against the opposite wall. But there was nowhere to hide, and his maneuver would have done little more than purchase seconds were it not for the beams of light which pierced the clone's head, dropping the trooper to the ground. Thirteen panted hard, looking around for where the shots had come from and taking several moments to spot the collapsed form of Emiliana, half buried in liquid dirt, her rifle cradled in her right arm, his hell pistol clutched in her left hand, both barrels hot and smoking. She was gasping as well, and clearly wounded, though it was hard to tell how badly. The barefaced Krieger staggered to her and bent down to help her up, offering his hand. She grinned with a wince at the gesture, though Emiliana pushed his pistol back into his hand instead of taking it. Guard up, Thirteen, said the corporal, voice pained. He nodded and took the weapon, and no sooner had he that he felt a hard shot crash into the back of his shoulder smashing the flak plate there and burning his chemically treated coat. He fell face first into the mud and spun, both he and Emiliana aiming their weapons up and firing at the three new clones who leered into their trench. After a few tense seconds of exchanged fire, one of the replicate died and the other two retreated away, tossing a grenade into their wake. The corporal sucked in a breath, but Thirteen acted without hesitation, sweeping his leg and kicking the round explosive into a pile of corpses several feet to their right. The two covered their heads and braced as the thing detonated, showering them in more blood and viscera, but otherwise not harming either. They snapped their guns up, ears ringing, almost bleeding, and waited, listening to the rain falling, battle sounding all around them. Yet, as time dragged itself by, nothing more came for them. The two looked at each other and realized that the only sound they could hear consistently after a time was the sound of the rain. Gradually, Thirteen picked himself up, careful not to slip, and with great trepidation, peeked up with his one good eye, looking over the lip of the trench, nothing but rain and mud. Where are they? asked Emiliana, still laying on the ground. Gone, said Thirteen, turning back towards her and kneeling, holstering his gun as he began to try to help her get up to her feet. The Cadian grit her teeth and hissed, but did slowly rise, leaning against the Krieger heavily. Gregor! She croaked through a hoarse throat. No response. Gregor! She yelled more loudly. <laughs> I'm... I'm still alive, Corporal. He groaned from nearby. Jack is... here, not moving. He managed to add, sounding not much better than dead. Save your breath, Emiliana said, looking around for the rest of her squad. Where'd they go? She asked softly, referring to the enemy. 
Thirteen shrugged a little, ambling next to her as they began to gather the survivors near them and put down the replicate who yet lived. At first, it seemed baffling, their sudden absence, the quiet. But slowly, Thirteen started to pick up on fainter sounds and realized the most probable explanation as he did. The Major, Thirteen said. Huh? asked the Cadian beside him. It must be the Major, he said. She paused, listened, and then nodded, flashing a pained grin. You must be right! Lazarus would rather go round two with Rajulia, or request a transfer from Indricta than be where he was now. The wind tugged and teased, sometimes weak and sometimes making him feel like a plucked spider clinging onto a single string. The only reason he was here now, the one thing he wouldn't do, was let his men down. Technically, all the soldiers under his new command were his men, but Lazarus had been the head of a squad prior to his insane elevation and those men were truly his brothers. Even as the wind tore at him, tempting his adhering boots to release the metal surface he walked on, he would not let them down. Even as he felt brand new sensations of fear and dread poking holes in his nerves, his arms kept reeling in the rappel line, feeding it into his winding belt spool. Even as he reached the position just below the lip of the platform, belt-mounted rope and magnetic soles holding him tenuously in place as he and several thousand Columbian patriots unslung various weapons, he did not falter. At least not too much. The former sergeant bunched the muscles in his neck, keeping his eyes fixed upwards towards the gray, raining sky. His goggles kept the water out of his eyes, but obscured the shifting, indistinct forms of the clouds and made blurry the rigid, silver towers reaching for them from the edges of his vision. As little as that view provided for him, it was leagues better than looking down and awakening within himself that foregone fear which struck him whenever he found himself gazing into a far-flung abyss. Major! Hey, Major! called one of the men around him, a thickly set man hefting a sniper rifle. Lazarus craned his neck to look at the corporal, only realizing the mistake of his instinct when the corner of his eye skimmed the drop below them and just after he centered his vision on the soldier's shit-eating grin. His wounds, and particularly his freshly applied cybernetics, ached badly and ate away at his typical patience. The metal arm had been hastily grafted onto him by a cavalcade of tech priest survivors. While he was grateful to have the use of his burnt and now amputated arm back in his service, the trauma of the loss and the constant deep pain the sedated wound assaulted him with was another one of those things he was trying not to think about. Glaring, he locked eyes with his former corporal. Damn you, Jackson! You better have a good reason for getting my attention! Lazarus barked, keeping his voice from veering into a higher than dignified pitch, though only by a few scant octaves. Sure do, Sarge. I mean, Major, said the man. I understand the part of the plan that gets us here, behind the enemy while their cocks are swinging. I get that we gotta take down all their limping tanks to secure evac. But what I don't get is, how we're even going to get to evac when we mop them up? That main force is going to swing around for us, tanks or no tanks, and unless we plan to jump over the ledge, I don't see where we can pull back to. Lazarus grimaced. He knew his plan wasn't foolproof, and even though he had tried to account for this specific problem in particular, he really hoped he would not be forced to resort to it or any other tactics more desperate and unconventional than the one he was going to execute now. We gotta have faith that the flyboys cover us when it counts, Corporal. Stay Gumby. The Major said back, eyes aimed skyward once more. So, in other words, we're properly fucked whether we win or lose, the man said back sarcastically. 
And suck it up, Jackson. Whole platoon knows you've been proper fact ever since the sisters caught you listening to Talik, said another soldier hanging nearby, just close enough to not have to yell to be heard. Lazarus couldn't see Jackson's reaction to the barb, but he could hear the soft chuckling all around them and couldn't help but grin, particularly when the offended corporal snapped back. Empire Spire does not play Tawik music! You can't call literally anything played on a skier flute Tawik, otherwise you're just surrendering the whole genre to fucking Xenos! Hey, Jackson! How would you like to join me and get saddled with a moonbeam for the duration of our time on this rock, corporal? Lazarus asked, cutting the man off before he got too loud. He didn't see it, but Jackson shut right up, even his fresh blush washing off at the words, which he did not return. That's what I thought. That goes for the rest of you too. No more mouthing. Operation could begin any second and it needs to come out neat and tidy if anyone is coming out of this in one piece. Regiments on the bridge are bleeding to hold the enemy's attention. We've gotta make that sacrifice count. Har? Har! The soldiers around him said back, falling into grim silence afterwards, broken only intermittently by light chatter. And that didn't last long. Soon they all heard it, the sound of an anti-material rifle loosing its deadly shot, and then the deafening, roaring boom of a fiery explosion. Lazarus knew he could trust the officers under him to keep the men on time and in sync with the plan, but he couldn't help ordering the advance aloud in spite of that. Kill. He said, heedless of the fact that his Vox speed was silent, as were all the others turned off as a precaution to keep the enemy from detecting them. Captains and sergeants repeated the order all throughout the hanging line of readied soldiers. And as one, they activated their repel spools, causing them to reel in hard and fast, almost tossing the men over the lip of the platform. As planned, the snipers and their spotters hit the dirt and set up, as did the heavy weapons teams, aided by the few tech priests that had accompanied them. The other advancing fire teams began to divide, racing forward as they sprinted to close the distance. As Lazarus had hoped, the loud shot and explosion had drawn all eyes and focus away from the rear of the replicates column. This bought vital seconds, seconds he and the other Colombians spent rushing for all they were worth, angling for cover and veering out of what would soon become a lethal crossfire. As soon as he slid to a stop behind a disordered stack of discarded trees, he saw the telltale blue shots that signaled that they had been spotted. Before the blue bolts could even reach their resting points, the snipers and heavy weapons teams opened up creating thunder and flashes which could shame lightning as they tore into the rear lines of the replique. Heavy stubbers, auto cannons, Colombian chain guns, bolters, and a few heavy bolters trailed lines of thick projectile fire into the men and vehicles of the Republic, ripping bodies to shreds and blowing over a few of the walkers in just the opening volley. On top of that, though they were still somewhat distant, the fire teams began to pick targets engaging with bursts of automatic and semi-automatic fire as they continued their advance, Lazarus leading their way near the front. He had half hoped the chaos caused by their surprise assault would be enough to force a rout, or at least to keep them stumbling while they did their work. But the damned toy soldiers were clearly veterans, and they didn't scare easy. Even then they were regrouping and beginning to counterattack. But they had made a fatal flaw, one which the Imperium now fully exploited. The replica commander had assumed that the enemy lay trapped before him, and so had marched out with most of his forces. Though he had not been so foolhardy as to leave no defense behind, those troopers he had left were armed with almost exclusively flamethrowers, as Lazarus' scouting servo skulls had reported. The replicate ran around the flaming wreckage and burnt corpses of the few felled sniper tanks and the remains of the fuel tank, raising nozzles as they advanced. Lazarus raised his fist, and his command to hold and hunker down was relayed across the squads in short order. They waited, hitting the dirt or finding cover wherever they had to, until at last the first of the replicate came into effective range effective range of the rifles, not their own flamethrowers. 
rigid, white and yellow in the darkness and carrying explosive fuel tanks. The replicate quickly found themselves choking on bullets before long. Their pale, shell-like armor, though powerful enough to deflect some shrapnel, was far from sufficient to stop blessed Calambian rounds, cracking and bursting like civilian ceramics before the weighty touch of a hammer. The replicate yelled into their bucket-like helmets, charging through the rain of death, but precious few survived the harrowing hails of lead long enough to come into effective range of their flamethrowers. Those that unleashed their lethal torrents of fire took grim satisfaction in hearing the screams of the Calambians they'd reached. But their pained deaths were cold comforts, for the Patriots had spread out as a matter of habit, greatly reducing the effectiveness of the Republic Flamers' spread. A few of the Replicae managed to form pockets of entrenched resistance, but as holes were rent into their wider formations, the Calambians flowed in and around the defenders boxing the troopers in and moving behind them. Lazarus surveyed the battlefield as best he could, activating his vox speed and hearing the reports and chatter coming in from the other Calambian fighters. He was dissatisfied with how many of the men were getting hung up on those pockets of resistance, particularly given their initial advantage, but there was nothing for it. He snapped a few orders into his Vox channel, having the Patriots encircle and hammer their positions while he and the rest of the men prepared to assault the tanks. The Imperial fire support was running low on ammunition, the majority of their stockpiles having been left below to enable the rapid ascent of the heavy weapons teams on their repel lines. Even so, they had thrashed the artillery column wickedly. And as their thundering began to die down, the advancing Patriots pushed harder, knowing that the completion of the task now fell to them. In relatively short order, the Calambians had crossed most of the way to the column. A hissed report from one of the snipers informed Lazarus that the main body of the Republic forces was starting to attempt a haphazard disengagement, presumably having noticed the ambush. It didn't matter, he knew. The toy soldiers would come back running at full speed, and they would still never reach his men in time to save their precious limping tanks. He dashed across slurries of dirt and mud, boots sucking and thumping, the rain making everything gray and hazy. Lightning and air power lit the shrouded skies with brief bright flashes. Spinning, tumbling wrecks of dying war machines fell from the weeping void above, trailing flames like falling torches. Their impacts rattled the platform, spreading Promethean fires across the scorched park grounds, though nowhere close to the Major himself. Ahead of him, the silhouettes of the sniper tanks, both those still standing and those which had fallen, became clearer and clearer. Lit both by the flames coating the wreckage of the latter and the vicious gleam of the continuous artillery fire of the former. He ducked and wove around two bright blue bolts, and went aground, sliding in the dirt and coming to rest behind a pair of horse corpses, the remains of some of the earlier Rough Riders. The blue bolts belted and jostled the heavy, augmented cadavers, but the former mounts held their integrity for now. Ignoring the vicious throbbing of his wounds, Lazarus waved two fire teams over toward his position, radioing them to send their heavy armaments. Moments later, three Calambians with missile tubes had made their way over to him. What pattern are those weapons? Lazarus asked them, his back pressed tightly against the cold carcasses that made up his cover. Treadfeathers, said one, a woman with blonde hair streaked over her face and between her eyes. Tread what? Lazarus asked, taking a moment to pop up, using his last pistol to send a few lances of light toward the enemy just to keep their heads down. Tread feathers, she repeated, unslinging the compact launcher and presenting it as if to show it off. She certainly seemed smug enough about it. Lightest guided launchers in the fleet, she said proudly. Stole a whole crate full of them from, she began. Shut it, I don't want to know. Those slims loaded with crack missiles? The major snapped. The patriot pulled her weapon back towards her and grinned broadly. Har, just as ordered. Outstanding! Take your shots. I want each of you to take aim at the third leg of one of those limping tanks. Knock the big steel bastards over! Lazarus ordered. Yes, sir! 
she said before proceeding to take a knee along with the two others, bracing their weapons and aiming carefully. Lazarus and his immediate squad poked over their makeshift barricade and opened fire, covering the three Columbians as they lined up their shots. Three made-to-order metal circumcisions on the way! Shouted the launcher-bearing Columbian. Smoke, fire, and buckling steel followed the jibe, and one by one, the formidable three-legged tanks of the Republic began to topple and burn. Hey there, everybody. This is a fan with too much time, and I hope that you guys enjoyed this week's episode. It came out a little bit later. I'm sorry about that. Um, but before we jump into the Q and A's, I actually wanted to talk about something because it's a topic I wanted to, like, you know, sort of air out, like I did in the older after talks. And um, it basically, like, it basically comes from um, a few interactions I've had online with people concerning the nature of uh, of such science fiction works as, as you know, Warhammer and Dune, which largely inspired it, um, because. Um, I've, I've sort of seen these weird topics kick up around it, and some of them have, like, these SJW undertones, sort of like, uh, like, Paul Atreides is, I think you guys have seen this article sort of kicked around way before I bring it up, but, um, that Paul Atreides in the Dune series is, like, the ultimate mighty whitey, that being, um, you know, a person of Caucasian descent that shows up at a bunch of like uh, brown people's house and knocks on the door and becomes their messiah. Um, I think that the most prominent example that people like to bring up about this is um, The Last Samurai, which is supposed to be a movie about, you know, historical figures who are like the last samurai and they they take their um, western main character and put him all over that. Um, <clears throat> this isn't really to address that in particular. I mean, Paul Atreides is not a mighty whitey. I can understand why a person who is primed to look for those things may believe that upon first, like, inspection of the aesthetic of Dune, but anybody who believes that need only read into the novel with an earnestness, and they will very quickly see that Dune does not fall into this category. But another thing that I've been seeing that people, like, uh, are, like, they, like, just, this is just to point out the, the, the misconceptions that I see ha being had, and one of the most dangerous misconceptions I see being had, because, honestly, these beliefs about, oh, well, oh, it's, it's, it's pleasing the male audience, or, or it's too much for the white people, or, or something, whatever, those things I don't often find have a very large impact unless there's a person's name attached to it like people could get cancelled over things like this which I don't necessarily agree with but but it's very rare that we actually see people getting um that we see these things when they're not guided by something like that actually doing much because frankly what are you gonna do have Rune rewritten dig up the dead author and make him apologize there ain't nothing you can do about it neither nor would I you know be in favor of those things were they possible um, but one of the more, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, the more, uh, insulting almost, like, uh, uh, and much more present, that's what I should say, much more present, uh, misunderstanding that I see people having with Dune and with Warhammer 40k is that, <clears throat> one, that the fictional works themselves promote and propagate an idea of, um, 
of fascism or of of religious oligarchy or or, or theology where where it's like uh, where it encourages the people who enjoy the hobby to look for these things in real life to support an emperor of one form or another um, and to look for your messiah in w the people who are ostensibly just fallible men and certainly not anything resembling a true son of god who wouldn't have the difficulties that you see Paul Atreides and the emperor in 40k and other such figures um, experiencing so um, I see a lot of people kind of be like oh well I mean if you're into that doesn't that kind of mean that you're and obviously if you've been with my content you know that I'm I'm not in any way a supporter of that kind of ideology and I just felt that a, a, a moment should be taken to explain it um, and maybe less so with Warhammer 40k because Warhammer 40k is very tongue-in-cheek. It shouldn't be very hard to see that it is that way. Um, Dune less so. Dune is a very thick piece of work. It's a brilliant piece of work, but it is hard for a lot of people to read through it unless they are already interested in the subject matter. And the subject matter is much less about action scenes and base entertainment and more about a discussion of the philosophy of politics and what the government should do and what we should be wary of and that's really one of the things I wanted to focus on here because you know again Warhammer is really tongue-in-cheek so even when it's like oh yeah for the Emperor only a person with a, a truly simplistic mindset would actually begin to think this is a good thing um, you know, we, we tend to give Warhammer a pass, or the Imperium a pass, on a lot of the things that it does uh, under, the, under the context of things are so bad that this is the only way things get done. And I mean, we all know that's not 100% the case, but we also give humans slack, you know. I mean, we see how bad we can be to each other under these relatively tame circumstances of our modern day existence. And we imagine, oh, well, if you throw literal demons constantly invading everything and aliens being super evil and eating people's brains and getting off to their torture, like, you throw all that into it and suddenly you're like, okay, yeah, I mean, you know, suddenly the Imperium makes a lot more sense. Um, but as Gulliman is showing us, and as we could reason, uh, a lot of the stuff is superfluous and unnecessary. And, and again, it's, again, very tongue-in-cheek. It's not hard to see... Um, that it's not meant to be emulated because it's not physically emulatable. <laughs> uh, Dune's different, um, but people forget that what Dune is really about, and if you read, especially if you read all of the books, at least written by the original author, the message that comes through is that, and he said this explicitly, that that you shouldn't have an emperor, that mankind when it's forced to have, when, when mankind puts its fate in the hands of single men, of personalities basically, instead of people taking their own destinies and their own management into their own hands, at least largely, I mean we need to live in a community, don't get me wrong, this is not like we don't live in a community, but the idea of following not an ideal, that's what I should say, communities built around ideals versus communities built around figureheads and people because and by people I mean a person because um, a really great example of that in Dune just at the start before the story even begins is the Butlerian Jihad the Butlerian Jihad in Dune is the ban on all thinking machines and the Jihad itself is the actual army that went around at the time enforcing this so that all mankind would drop the use of of sentient machines and even like calculators and stuff like that. Initially, it wasn't so extreme. Initially, the leader of the Jihad just wanted to outlaw all forms of technology that exist at the expense of human existence and human suffering. And that's good. We don't want machines that make things worse, and we don't want machines that take away what little we have in this extremely finite existence we experience. Um, but she unfortunately dies, I think, she gets hit by a mine or something, it's not even like in a direct battle, but she dies, and her followers go into a frenzy, and they martyr her, 
And it goes from what I had just said, like a pretty reasonable standard technology, to even calculators are outlawed, no thinking machines at all. And that doesn't mean that there's no technology in Dune, of course. You know, you have shield generators and all kinds of guns and transport and whatnot. But, but things, machines aren't allowed to think anymore. All of that has to be done by humans. Um, so... What is the moral of that story? It's that if that jihad had been led more by the principles that woman had been trying to put forward as opposed to the woman herself, then her death wouldn't have had this catastrophic reversal of what she was trying to accomplish. Because ultimately what she wanted to do was to prevent tragedies such as the ones that she had already suffered from repeating. And all she did was perpetuate one of the largest tragedies in human existence. And don't get me wrong, ultimately the Butlerian jihad did a good thing because... Unlike in Warhammer 40k, humans sort of do benefit from this ban of technology because we begin gen to genetically enhance ourselves to the point of being able to just do everything ourselves. It makes mankind stronger genetically. It's just, whew, we take a very hard, hard way of getting there. And that's really the, 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 the whole core message behind Dune. I mean, even when you read all the way up to God Emperor of Dune, where Dune has their own God Emperor, um... And the Dune God Emperor is not an evil man, per se. He is a tyrant, and he is extremely cruel and callous, but he also does truly love, like, feel love, love mankind, love people in within mankind. It's just that his whole thing, the whole lesson that the God Emperor of Dune tries to teach and the thing that he tries to impart onto mankind at the end of it when he finally dies and kicks the bucket is stop having God Emperors. Stop making men your gods, you know. And part of the reason why he made his regime the most oppressive and restrictive and entirely controlled regime in all existence was because he was supposed to be saying like, well, several things. The, the Dune is a very multi-layered book, but one of the key things he was trying to say by doing that, the God Emperor, by doing all these horrible things for so many thousands of years onto mankind, was, well, it was basically like, stop doing this. Like, you made the most powerful ultra being in existence to lead you. And what this being's ultimate lesson is, is stop making beings like this. Stop relying on beings like this you know like the only reason that i'm required to enforce this incredibly cruel regime onto you to save mankind in the future and to adhere to the golden path is because all of you won't do it yourselves and you can and you could it's just harder for you which means that i have to do it for you and that means that you all have to suffer basically um it's a pretty hardcore message but like, a, like the whole point of the Empire living and existing for so many thousands of years is so that no one will ever forget the tyranny of the God Emperor and no one will ever get another God Emperor again. I mean, that's a huge part of it at the very least. Another part of it is um, to do with human evolution and the breeding program and wanting to want... Like another part of it is literally repressing mankind so hardcore for so long that when the pressures are moved mankind acts like a spring and goes out into the cosmos and spreads out and diversifies and and stops being so apathetic and restrictive and and you know that's my whole point is just that the messages of these things even 40k and especially dune though dune is much harder to get through is that you're not supposed to be tribalistic that these things hurt, that even done in the best possible way, all that they try to do in the best possible way is get you to stop doing them, to get you to stop supporting these crazy methods of, um, of control and of uh, absolute governance. There is no God Emperor. There is no um, like single super powerful figure that's going to control us and, and dominate us for the better. And if they did control us and dominate us for the better, it would be to make us eventually do it ourselves. It's not a perpetual thing. We're not meant to exist in that state. And whenever we do, we subject ourselves to incredibly heinous and widespread suffering. So 
to those who think that Warhammer 40k is supposed to be, or that Dune is supposed to be an open portal to this belief system that ultimately leads to fascism, and admittedly, some people may take it that way without actually absorbing the material all the way and be really big fans of these products without realizing that they are cautionary tales. You have to remember that there is unimaginable and unwarranted suffering in the Imperium, and that in Dune, the God Emperor's whole plan and the entire thing, if you're 100% rah 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 for the God Emperor, I think he knew the best, realize that the best thing he was trying to do is get you to get rid of him, is to get you to stop needing him, is to get you to, to seize you know, existence into yourselves and to begin doing basically what the Bene Gesserit were doing in the book, but not just the Bene Gesserit, but like the vast mass of mankind so that diversity would 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 win out and and you wouldn't need him to seize control and do it all so harshly um and of course dune is a philosophical book so there's many many you know there can be a huge philosophical debate on that however what can't be debated is simply this the god emperor's rule was extremely repressive it created a lot of suffering it stifled mankind it created chaos after he left and that in no way shape or form is a government that pursues the following of a single individual, um, a, a government that is in any way stable, sound, or going to last longer than the individual themselves lasts. Um, and, you know, this may or may not be particularly relevant because of the times we live in, and I won't make a point on talking about that, but I will say this. If there is one thing that you can draw that is like in any way tribalistic or truly fascistic about these properties is that they allow that experiencing them and having fun within them allows us to exercise these more destructive habits that are ingrained into our our natures as men as as men and women as as humans without actually enforcing them into the world or hurting or harming anybody by their practice but anybody who partakes of these things should be pretty well aware of the fact that these are pure fictions and that not only do we hope that they never exist they should never exist this should never happen um like jesus christ is the only one who should ever have control of mankind and if he shows up it'll be pretty obvious that it's him because the guy will like literally be able to speak a word and then reality conforms to him he won't have to convince you it'll just be done reality will conform so it's not you know it won't be a debate if it ever comes down to it. That's what I'm trying to say. So if you're debating it, you're doing it wrong. You know, these fictions, these fantasies, they're not to enforce the idea of a single person taking control. They're cautionary tales. And that's my spiel. Uh, that's all that off my chest. And now that I've got that done, let me go ahead and hit up the Q&A so that we can get a little bit of that done as well. Let's go from the top to the bottom. Let's say. Q&A. Will there be any Imperial Saints? Uh, you'll have to wait and see. I'm not, like, if there are and if there aren't, I'm not, like, the information gets given away no matter how I answer that question. So, whether I am or whether I aren't, you gotta wait to see that one. And that was uh, Axel Gadstrid. I'm sorry, I do not. Gadstedt. I don't know how to pronounce that. And anyway, in any case, um, now we'll go to XZ Moon. XZ Moon. Q and A. I would be wrong. I could be wrong, but are the Colombians? Are the Colombians are from Planet America or based on America? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead and read my um, my. <laughs> my um descriptions um that i've left in the uh the community section um i've left a whole lot of tertiary lore for anybody who's interested especially in the calambians recently um but yes the calambians are certainly based on america on the united states and on like popular uh media from the united states so yes let me see here keep going down to the next one justin holt Q&A, kind of a goofy question, but I remember in the beginning, when the Atlas of Steel was destroyed, you mentioned several megatons of ceramite being lost on top of the civilians. Seeing as ceramite is seemingly unique to the 40k universe, do you plan, plan on mentioning that? 
Um, ceramite is actually not a material that you mine. Ceramite is a material that is manufactured. It's a ceramic, I believe. Um, so while a lot of ceramite was lost, one thing is that it will be recovered because the 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 the, the Imperial fleet dominated that that void space um, after defeating the Republic. So there's no reason they wouldn't recover it. And two, they will have the facilities on board the uh, Arc Mechanicus ships that have come with them mm-hmm. to produce. Oops, sorry about that. To produce more. And, uh, let me see here. Okay. So, um, let me see. Sorry about that. My phone is going off. Someone's trying to get in contact with me. They're going to have to wait. I'm going to get this done first. Q&A, here we go. Sebeka. Is that how, how, how I think you say it? Sebeka? Q&A. Since we, all, since we have already seen Ogrens, what are the chances that we'll see other Abhumans in the future? Very high. Very, very high that you will see other Abhumans in the future. Let's see here. Uh, will we get any short stories focusing on Imperial Settlers on Tatooine? <laughs> Just wait and see. But, uh... Softly, I will say, softly currently, yes, there is a plan for that, absolutely. It should be very enjoyable as well. Um, let me see here. Lastly, since you have confirmed the existence of rogue traders, will we see any of them have some Xenos mercenary in their employment? <laughs> Wait and see. Ooh, that's a good question, Sebeka. Nice. All right, let's go on to the next one. Um... Let's see here. Q&A from No. <laughs> what would the Sith think of Chaos and the Chaos Gods, and how would they react to each god? Ooh, man. That is a juicy question, but I'm not sure that I can answer it without giving away certain things that may occur in the story. So I'll have to say that you'll have to maybe wait and see. Can't promise I can tell you how the Sith in general would think of it, but you may very well get a few particular reactions from a few particular characters that you all may be looking forward to uh, seeing react to that. In any case, let's go ahead and move it along to the next one. Uh, Alright, Eric, Eric Muller. Q&A. Are coming from Imperial Guard regiments, Zen, the three you already mentioned... It would be fun if the chaos, if the clones react to the Steel Legion, the Catch Angel Fires, or the Morden Iron Guard, for example. That will be done much more in Season 2. Right now, um, it's sort of just a mishmash of clones getting thrown against a mishmash of regiments on this planet, and neither one is really holding home territory or fighting in. in it, you'll see a lot more like um, regiment and clone reactions to each other when we get into season two. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So let's move along. Richard Corn. Mmm, Corn. For the Q and A, does the Crimson Razors emulate the Black Templars? Include their Legion building? Uh, not quite. But not because they've really chosen not to. It's more the case that the Crimson Rages, Crimson Rages. Crimson Razors have not crossed that bridge yet. Um, they would cross it once they reached uh, total chapter capacity, and then we're like, okay, do we keep recruiting? They're just short of that. Um, they're not literally a thousand Space Marines. They're just short of that. So let's see here. Oh, there's quite a few questions here. Do pre-existing characters have more plot armor than characters made for the story? Yes, they do. Uh, I can't just waste, you know, an Obi-Wan or Anakin on stuff. That being said, um, I don't really apply that much plot armor to a lot of the Jedi and stuff. Like, for example, um, Ayla doesn't have plot armor. Um, you guys may think she does because she survived that Inquisitor, that radical Inquisitor encounter, but she doesn't have plot armor. Um, you'll notice that when she grabbed at her chest, that's where her pin, her communications pin was. So when she was squeezing her hand, even though she was frozen, what she had been doing from the very moment that he had paralyzed her was calling the clone commandos to come get her. And of course, the clone commandos were like, oh, hey, the general's calling us. 
Oh wow, she's really ping she's really pinging us a lot. I've never actually seen <laughs> any other Jedi just sit there and ping us uh, on the emergency channel over and over. Maybe we should get the lead out, and so you know they showed up thinking that she was in some pretty deep trouble because she's sitting there pressing that button over and over and over and not responding to the com. So um, uh, my point is just that that she doesn't actually have plot armor. Characters will just have events occur. And that doesn't necessarily require plot armor. I don't think I made her more powerful or less powerful or made the clones do anything they don't do in canon. That was all um, pretty by the book. Uh, Jedi will, you know, I don't think that, that because pre-existing characters have plot armor sometimes that it applies to everybody, as Shock T has also demonstrated. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> Nurgle is love. Nurgle is life. All praise the plague father with the with the cor with the corpse of death. Ah, yes, yes, Nurgle, Nurgle. Uh, for some reason, I just imagined Shrek Nurgle, and it's like the most horrifying thing I've ever imagined in my mind. So, moving along, uh, how thoroughly are the tech priests studying droid tech? Any chance of the Imperium will start using droids in any capacity? Wait and see. Five, any chance of pre-existing characters from 40k like Caiaphas Kane, Ibram Gaunt, or Gregor Eisenhorn showing up? I don't, I don't, you know, this is one of the biggest problems with me trying to use characters from the 40k universe. I don't really know the timeline of the 40k universe super well. I'm under the impression that Caiaphas Kane has retired and that he may not even be alive by the point of um of what of what's happening in the current setting where we have uh, Gulliman returned, the Primarch returned, the Indominus Crusades wrapped up. Um, because I think that even the Indominus Crusade wrapping up and getting us to of, of course that's not where we are right now, my bad. If I'm gonna talk about this, it's just prior to the Indominus Crusade, just prior to it starting. Um, but my point is that I don't know that any of those characters are actually still alive or active or not deceased at these points in time. Um, if somebody can get me get back to me on that, uh, let me know what Caiaphas came, Ibram Gaunt, and Gregor Eisenhorn are up to in this current time period. Um, and, and if some of them are available, then it will become a possibility. I can promise you that I'll at least consider it. Um, but so far as I know... I just don't know, and so I can't use them until I do. In any case, that's how you guys can help me out if you want to. Let me know. Um, will we see any Jedi defect to the Imperium? Uh, you'll have to wait and see, but... You know, you'll have to wait and see. How will the Republic react if they learn about virus bombs? You'll have to wait and see. <laughs> what am I going to tell you that... Virus bombs aren't going to get used and the Republic isn't going to see it. You'll just have to wait and see when it happens. Um, all right, I'll do one more question because I think that I'm starting to get up there in the time. So, let's see here. Nurali Bolotov. Bolotayev. There we go. Q&A. Where are the Scions? Ah, you want the Scions, huh? The Scions are doing things. Uh... <laughs> You guys might notice that um, I haven't really come back to Quinlan Voss, Ram Coda, and the assault on the HQ yet. That is going on. The Scions may be dealing with that, or trying to. In any case, you know, armies of Jedi are what they are. Uh, who is Grievous more loyal to, Dooku or Sidious? I'm going to say Dooku, because he has more face time with Dooku, and because he probably suspects Sidious of being some kind of Jedi, or... I mean, he knows that Dooku was a former Jedi, um, but he just doesn't... He doesn't respect the Sith or the Jedi. Um, that's not really how Grievous understands things. He understands that Sidious is Dooku's boss, so he is ostensibly also Grievous' boss, but if... Grievous had been left to stew for like a few weeks after the death of Dooku and, and you know, his death couldn't be obtained at that point. He may very well just go rogue and seize control of the Confederacy. Um, Grievous, both of the different Grievouses have very different motivations outside of the Sith and the Jedi and their power plays and understanding of the Force. So it's hard to say. 
um, whether or not he would have stayed loyal to Sidious even. But I think it's pretty safe to say that until Sidious shows up and whips his ass and shows him what's up, um, he's more loyal to Dooku. Mostly because Dooku has done this. So there you go. Uh, let's see here. Uh, actually, I think I'm going to go ahead and call it that and call it there before we get too far up there because even me I'm starting to get tired you can hear me holding back my yawns <sighs> and that will go away fuck me ugh. in any case ugh. so uh, oh oh curious uh, a little curiosity if you guys um you know you want to let uh, uh, t- uh, fuck my brain is scrambled you want to chime in on um uh, a bit of a question I have for you guys. Um, which one of the ongoing narratives so far between the different characters who are all separated having their own stories have you enjoyed so far and which one are you most eager to get back to right at this moment? I'm not saying this is going to have an impact on how I write the story um, but I am saying that I am very, very curious to know. Um, and again, if you guys have any feedback on the story that you want to give me, you know, always feel free to give me back that feedback. Um, if you have negative feedback, you know, I am a little bit of a sensitive person, so phrase it respectfully, you know, try not to use idioms and phrases that are like equating my work to poop or garbage, even if you don't mean it meanly, just know that it doesn't make an author feel well, even when you're trying not to make it purely contentious. Um, but aside from that, please let me know what you think as far as that's concerned. And if nothing else, let me know which one of those you liked most and which one uh, you're most eager to, back, to get back to. So until then, I'll see you guys next time.